Hello, everyone. My name is Garrett Wong. I'm the Member Services Manager here at the Green Sports Alliance. On behalf of the entire Alliance team, we hope you all are staying safe and healthy, and we thank you for taking the time to join us today. Apologies for the late start to the day, but it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all as we celebrate the fifth anniversary of Green Sports Day today. And we welcome you to our conversation titled Green Sports Day Fireside Chat, a journey through the past, present, and future of the GSA. We also want to thank LNS Captioning for providing some closed captioning services for today's session. More information on how to use that service is in the chat box on the uh, sidebar within your screen. And you'll also be seeing our videos here very shortly as I'll toggle off after these introductions. Um, feel free to resize the video feed and the slides uh, based on your own personal preference. So we will be making these uh, webinar recordings available following today's session. And you'll, you should be uh, able to view all of these within our Green Sports Alliance YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash Green Sports Alliance. Um, for our members, we have some other archives that we have as well. Feel free to send us questions at info at greensportsalliance.org and we can get those over to you if you wanna access some of our deeper archives within our webinar uh, resources. And for those members out there and for anyone else interested, another reminder that in just one week, we'll be having our 10th annual Green Sports Alliance Summit now going virtual on Tuesday, October 13th and Wednesday, October 14th with speakers from the IOC, Nike, NatureWorks, Major League Baseball, ESPN, and many others. Uh, feel free to visit our GSA Summit website at greensportsalliance.org slash summit. Feel free to reach out to myself or info at greensportsalliance.org email for any questions and for members out there um, for discounts um, available to GSA members and partners. Now, without further ado, I will be sending this over to our Executive Director, Roger McClendon, to be our moderator for today's session. Um, as many of you may know already, Roger uh, assumed the role as the Executive Director of the Green Sports Alliance in January of 2019. Prior to joining the Alliance, Roger was the first ever Chief Sustainability Officer for Young Brands, whose holdings include Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, and KFC restaurants. He also led the development of Blue Line, uh, sustain, a sustainable design guide for restaurants built on the LEED certification uh, program. Roger, I'll welcome you to bring your video and audio um, back online here, and uh, I will let you take things away. Thank you, Garrett. Can you hear me? Just thumbs up if you can. All right, perfect. So first of all, happy Green Sports Day, everyone, and welcome to our panelists and our listeners joining us today. On October 6, 2016, President Obama declared the inaugural Green Sports Day to acknowledge sustainability leadership within the sports industry and establish a call to action for more innovative sustainability leadership within the sports industry. To establish action and more innovative approaches, I'm sorry, to tackle climate change through sports. The Stanley Cup champion Pittsburgh Penguins and the Green Sports Alliance were there to witness this significant moment. Together, we have the power to build momentum around this historic day to increase the awareness of the sports screening movement across fans, sports executives, and corporate leaders around the world to inspire greater action to build more sustainable and just communities where we live, work, and play. On Green Sports Day today, we celebrate these efforts and rec recommit to building a cleaner, safer, and healthier planet for all. I would also like to acknowledge that all our partners, leagues, teams, and athletes who have come together to celebrate the fifth annual Green Sports Day and help us grow into this green sports movement. I'd like to share a brief highlight video narrated by two-time U.S. Women's National Soccer Olympic champion and gold medalist Julie Foudy and directed and produced by Robin Raj, founder of the Citizen Group.
apologies, folks, trying to see where the audio issue may be here. Just give us one moment. Apologies for the uh, lack in audio for the video. Perhaps we'll come back to that um, after some introductions for the panel. Uh, Roger, I'll pass it off to you to uh, introduce the uh, panelists for the conversation today. Absolutely. Sorry about the difficulties. So uh, we got an awesome panel, unbelievable panel here today. So let's jump in to do the introduction. So Mary Harvey is the CEO of the Center for Sport and Human Rights. Prior to her role at the center, Mary developed the human rights strategy for the successful United 2026 bid, which will bring the 2026 FIFA World Cup games to Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Mary has held a variety of senior roles in sports governance, including with FIFA, women's professional, and U.S. soccer. She is also a former executive board member of the Green Sports Alliance. Mary enjoyed an eight-year career with the U.S. women's national soccer team, winning Olympic gold in 1996, and the inaugural FIFA Women's World Cup in 1991. Welcome, Mary, thanks for joining us. Also, thanks, absolutely, welcome. Also, we'd like to introduce Dennis, Dennis Hayes. He is president of the Bullet Foundation, where he developed his first 50,000 square foot building to be fully certified under the Living Building Challenge. Earlier in his career, Hayes was director of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory professor of engineering at Stanford, environmental lobbyist, and a Silicon Valley lawyer. In 1970, 1970, he dropped out of Harvard to become the national coordinator of the first Earth Day. And over the past 50 years, he grew it into the most widely observed secular holiday in the world. Dennis has been profiled as New York Times person in the news and Time Magazine's hero of the planet. Happy 50th Earth Day. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you for being Thanks, here. Roger. Absolutely. Jason McClellan, considered one of the world's most influential individuals in the field of architecture and green building movement today. McClellan is the creator of the Living Building Challenge. He's the author of six books on sustainability and design. He's the founder of the International Living Future Institute and is the CEO of McClellan Design, his own architectural and planning practice, designing some of the world's most advanced green buildings like Climate Pledge Arena. So welcome, Jason. Thanks for being here. My pleasure, good to be here, guys. Absolutely, so Omar Mitchell. Omar is Vice President, Sustainable Infrastructure and Growth Initiatives at the National Hockey League. Mitchell started his career at the NHL in 2012 as the league's first environmental sustainability director. Overseeing the NHL Green Initiative, he holds an MBA from MIT's Sloan School of Management, a master's degree in architecture from Columbia University, and is a lifelong University of Florida Gator. Congratulations on NHL Green's 10 year anniversary, Omar. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Roger. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So we apologize for the tech, technical uh, difficulties, but we such have such a powerhouse panel. I'd like to go ahead and, and get started. So the first part of the group discussion really is around sharing reality and we want this to be uh, conversational and, and have people jump in. But I'm gonna challenge Mary with this question here. So Mary, 
the social, economic, environmental, and health crisis demands action from all industries and all sectors. But there is a particularly powerful nexus between sports, sustainability, and human rights. As the CEO of the Center for Sports and Human Rights, can you share the issues and the work you're doing that sits at the intersection between sports and sustainability? And secondly, how can sports most affect positive change? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back with the Green Sports <laughs> Alliance, my home. Um, so, Roger, you and I started with our, our new roles on the same same month, I think. So yes. January of last year. Um, you know, at the center, we're tracking uh, two main, I mean, we, we cover quite a bit uh, of space when it comes to human rights and sports, including how to ensure that sports respects human rights um, in either day-to-day -day sport or mega sporting events like the World Cup or the Olympics. Um, but two trends that are particularly top of mind right now uh, that we're looking at. One is, is the impact of COVID. Um, and we're seeing with the impact of COVID, um, you know, people, and I used to work in sport, you know, as an executive for a sports governing body, you know, uh, FIFA and, and others. So the size and scope of the impact of COVID on sports is, is massive. Um, I mean, you're making, in some cases, existential decisions and you're having to make them quickly. So the stakes are super high. Um, and given that, um, are you ensuring that as you make these big decisions, you're not leaving people behind? And what we've seen is, is we've seen two groups um, in particular, though there may be others, who get left behind, and that's women and women's sports and uh, sports with persons with disabilities. Um, and those two areas, uh, so we've been advocating, one, for awareness of this. Um, you know, we can't save male elite sport at the expense of others, and particularly when it comes to any government assistance, like bailouts, that might be considered to support uh, the sports industry, that any such earmarks include protections for um, for particularly vulnerable groups, so that nobody gets left behind as we rebuild sport after COVID. The second thing that we're seeing um, is athlete activism, and we're seeing athlete activism um, in in unprecedented ways. Uh, you know, I we we clearly remember the Mexico City Olympics. Uh, 2026, Omar, Omar, you're too young. Jason, you probably too. But um, you know, Tommy Smith and uh, and John Carlos, you know, uh, demonstrated for Black Power. Muhammad Ali. But now we're seeing, you know, the entire NBA stops playing. I mean, just just big things are happening now, and it's athletes' way of saying the world around us is not okay. You know, I leave the arena where everybody's equal, and the only thing that matters is performance. And I get into my car and I get pulled over and I get asked, what is that your car, right? So athletes are saying, this is not okay. And so we at the Center for Sport and Human Rights, uh, the freedom of expression, including an athlete's right to peacefully say and express their views is not only a fundamental human right, it's an enabling human right. So it's a human right that enables the achievement of other human rights that everybody has. They're not aspirational, we all have them by virtue of the fact that we live and breathe. So these are two areas. And so when you see things like the Black Lives Matter movement, you see all over the world athletes starting to protest, or in the case of Iran, Hakeem, um, excuse me, uh, Naveed Afkari, the wrestler who was recently executed, for participating in a protest. And he was targeted, we believe, because he was an athlete and high profile. And if we can touch somebody who's that popular, who's next? like nobody's safe. So it's this idea of actually using athletes as a way to repress civil society. So we take athlete activism incredibly seriously. Um, and we believe in an athlete's right to peacefully protest in a way that doesn't endanger others. So you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater and some other things, but, um, but it's incredibly important. So those are two areas that we're tracking right now pretty closely um, at the center. I uh, appreciate that perspective, and it really helps demonstrate, you know, the high level and the important, you know, where human rights sit at the center of kind of this nexus that we're talking about. So thank you for sharing that. We'll we'll continue the conversation, you know, with Dennis um, and kind of weaving this in. You know, Dennis, you've made a really huge impact with organizing the first Earth Day, you know, over 50 years ago and the Earth Day Network. What should the next generation of leadership do to make the most significant impact 
and conserving the natural environment of our planet and obtaining, as I expanded, and I saw this on your website, social and environmental justice. Uh, and can you paint the picture of reality, you know, through your through your career? Uh, well, I should say that I was not one of the people singled out by Mary that might not have noticed what was happening in the Mexico City Olympics. I was <laughs> well into adulthood by then. Uh, sure, we are we are at a point right now where we're facing a variety of uh, environmental issues, some of which are essentially existential. Um, when you when you try to wrestle with climate change, you're talking about something that now has a century and a half of momentum behind it, a gigantic global force pouring out greenhouse gases from every nation on earth and every industry and every power plant. And um, it's going to be difficult to turn around and yet we have to turn it around, not just sort of rapidly, but almost immediately or or suffer just extraordinary consequences. This is something where the National Academy of Sciences 38 years ago issued a report saying that if we wait until the time when it is absolutely unmistakable that there is evidence of man-made climate change, uh, then it will be too late. Uh, well, it's too late. It's too late to avoid these problems now because we burned 4 million acres in California this year with climate enhanced forest fires. We have five active hurricanes at the same time over the Atlantic, including a new one now that's heading up toward the Gulf. We've got droughts in the Midwest. We've got issue after issue that most adversely affect the poor of this country and the destitute of the world who have done the least to contribute to the issues. Then you have a series of things that are the historic environmental issues that are much more place based. It's the the river that catches on fire, the air pollution in a particular city, the water pollution in Flint. Uh, once again, with the principal burdens falling upon the poorest members of the society. So when we try to wrestle with these issues inherently, uh, we're, we're wrestling with something that is an environmental justice issue. You can't clean up a little bit of the air, you gotta clean up the air. Uh, so we're the process now is finally get to your question, as we're, as we're looking ahead, to try to find common cause with every diverse sort of organization and group of citizens and social cause out there to say, let's not talk about an environmental movement and a civil rights movement and a women's movement and a human rights movement. Let, let's talk about the movement for a sustainable, just future and link ourselves together. And obviously at a critical point in all of that, athletes uh, just have a unique kind of role. Uh, when an astrophysicist, uh, a, a geomorphologist, uh, a conservation biologist talks about something, you generally don't have a whole bunch of news cameras hanging around trying to put the thing on ESPN or Fox. Or we, and we tend to talk in terms that are often not easily understood by a broad cross-section of the population. Athletes have become uh, Initially now, I'd, I'd say with regard to social justice issues, but also a fair number of them with regard to environmental issues, enormously effective spokespeople who are skilled at taking complex ideas and reducing them to things that resonate with the broad popular audience and then have built in microphones of folks who want to hear what they have to say. So we're eager to work with them. Uh, and, and finally, I should sign off by saying, since I think you're heading off to Jason next, that an important part of being able to communicate on an issue is to be walking your talk. And what, what is important about this is that we're seeing stadiums now that are getting enormously green, turning to renewable energy and energy efficiency and water conservation. Things like our cups, the, the recycled and reusable cups that are being used to get rid of tons and tons of trash in ways that eliminate endocrine disruptors and plastic problems with the oceans. And as, as the Green Sports Alliance has moved into that realm with so much vigor and so much success over the last couple of decades, you've given a platform to your athletes to carry on this message. Thanks, Dennis. That, that really sets it up. And, and the hard part, you know, working uh, for a really successful CEO at Young Brands was really painting that picture of reality, as painful as it may be. Um, you have to before you can figure out what the solutions are and where to prioritize your resources. So we appreciate that, you know, um, truth. Um, so now with Jason and, you know, Jason, as an architect, you're obviously a skilled systems thinker. 
designer and strategist with the most important action sports, what is the most important action sports can take to make the most impact on social and environmental crisis the world is facing? How do we effectively motivate, measure, measure and determine success? So now before I pass it over, Dennis set us up really well. You know, it's already here. So how do we think our way and innovate our way out of this box? So good to be here, guys. Uh, Roger, thanks for having me. Uh, wonderful to be on this uh, amazing panel and, and really great actually to follow uh, the comments that both Mary made and, and my, my good friend Dennis made. Um, I, in every, every uh, talk that I've been doing, I've been talking about this year as being the year of perfect vision, 2020. And I, I borrowed that uh, phrase from my great mentor, Bob Berkebile, who told me that it was going to be this back in 1997. He said this, so he, he was uh, a futurist, as it turns out. But the idea is that uh, this year is laying bare all of the issues that we have to tackle. And if we aren't seen clearly now, uh, then I don't know what will uh, help us see it. It's like the lens is being taken out, right? And we're starting to see all these issues that have been there for, for quite a long time, that scientists have known for a long time, that social justice workers have known for a long time, that we need to deal with inequalities, we need to deal with racial injustice, we need to deal with climate change. There's a host of issues, and it's like as if the universe decided to put it all in our lap in this one year to say, deal with this. And that is what is uh, remarkable about this moment in time. And really for me, a moment in time for the Green Sports Alliance and all of us who care about these issues to shine together. Um, so when you ask about this question, I, you know, I would answer it in two ways. I'll answer it in kind of a big picture way and then maybe in a, in a technical way. The big picture way, I, I'll build upon what, what Mary was discussing that um, certainly the idea that we need to have a, a platform for our athletes uh, to speak their piece, speak their minds, and bring issues to the public is huge. And this really gets at you know, the, the heart of the power of sports. Um, the idea that we can have engagement around, uh, you know, and Dennis was talking about this as well, the, the, the size of, of the audience and the reach of sports to cross lines, to reach into, into areas because look, we've known about the science of climate change for a long time. And, and for the most part, our politicians are not listening. The general public is not listening. And, and so there, there needs to be better platforms uh, to, to talk about a whole host of issues. And I believe that sports and entertainment generally are one of the most powerful ways we can do that. So the idea of all of, you know, all the various sports teams and leagues coming together in a much more concerted way to really push fan engagement, I think is really uh, around all these issues together uh, is really important uh, and critical right now. And when we're, especially when all of them are kind of in disarray in terms of their schedules and when can they reopen, this is the time they should be planning that. When we come back in 2021, what is our industry going to do about it? What is our message going to be? And, and wouldn't it be powerful if this was a concerted message? And then just to, then answer the technical side of it. If there was one thing that I wish that all the various stadiums and arenas would focus on technically, so the first thing is operational. It doesn't cost anything to reach out and, and tell a story. So they need to just be doing it. But the technical side of it is, in my mind, that we need to be in, in the most rapid way possible decarbonizing our world. And so every single stadium and arena and venue today needs to come up with a plan to get rid of all their fossil fuels and to get rid of all their internal combustion engines and their fleets and de decarbonize everything. This needs to be the mission today. Planning is free. Start thinking about it now. Don't, you know, don't connect to natural gas ever again. Reduce the, the amount of natural gas you're using right now. Don't buy another internal combustion engine vehicle ever, period, end of stop, only buy electric and then look for renewables and offsets. This is the message that we need to have, and that should be part of the core uh, thinking, I think, with the Green Sports Alliance as well. So I'm gonna end there with uh, with that, and I look forward to continuing this discussion, guys. I, I appreciate that uh, candor, I, I really do, because we're looking for solutions, you know, this, you know, for clean air, clean water, and, you know, kind of the pursuit of happiness, uh, <laughs> is what we're after, <laughs> not not a political contest, right? So I appreciate the straightforward answer. 
So Omar, uh, back to you. Uh, and we really kind of want to relate to what, the, you know, you have that perspective where you're representing the leagues and we have that close relationship with, you know, our MLB partners, NBA and others, where we've had these conversations, NASCAR as a group. So we appreciate you representing that group here today. Um, so tell us about, you know, specifically NHL's vision for what are the challenges you need to overcome to enhance the social environmental sustainability and how does that align with the NHL leadership and teams in the league in general? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, Roger, it's a pleasure to join you and, and to kind of share our perspective as well as um, share a little bit about some of the history. I mean, we have been, we are celebrating our 10 year anniversary as well and the Alliance too. I remember when we were in Portland and all the leagues shared a main stage panel with, with Paul Hanlon and myself and um, Mike Lynch from NASCAR and uh, Jarian from the NBA. This is a movement. This is not a moment. And this is something that we have been uh, striving for for a long time. And you certainly see it now more than ever. Just to echo the panelists, right? You're seeing this current health crisis. You're seeing the economic um, impact of this health crisis. You're seeing the social justice reckoning. All of these things under the rubric of, of, of our, climate, our, our climate emergency that's currently upon us, right? And so for us, what we are saying is we need to reframe it. And Dennis, I think to your point, we need to reframe this movement under something that everybody can get aligned on. And for us, it is about creating vibrant and healthy communities through hockey. And we do that through a myriad of different ways, through our diversity and inclusion efforts, our equity efforts, our environmental efforts, um, uh, in our physical literacy, in our learn to play and learn to skate programs. All of those programs contribute to creating this mantra of vibrant and healthy communities through hockey. And this is important because without any one of those pillars, we will not be successful. Environmental, financial, and social sustainability must work hand in hand. And this, is, and this is something that we're seeing reflecting across all the leagues. We're seeing that um, in Major League Baseball, we're seeing that folks on the social responsibility side are working in tandem with, with the facility operations side. No longer is environmental sustainability just about the performance of the venue. It must go beyond, um, uh, it must go towards this holistic view. And that is especially true for all of the leagues and especially true for the NHL in particular, because under our commissioner's direction, what we're saying is that we need to ensure that we have these livable communities, we have places and spaces that are, are um, thriving, and that we can offer these um, our, our, our hockey values to both the hockey saturated markets as well as to underserved communities. We must, we must address all of these concerns in a meaningful way. One example of that, just to illustrate the point, is our focus on community rinks, which is NHL Green 2.0, as I like to call it. And Green 2.0 is saying, how can we take all of the best practices that we've learned at the NHL pro level and take it down to the community rink level, where there is about 4,500 or so community rinks across North America. If we can instill environmental sustainability in these community rinks, we will achieve both the enviro, the financial, and ultimately the social sustainability that is needed to drive our sport. I.e., we're gonna see that these facilities are gonna operate more efficiently. We're gonna see that they are economically better business models. And finally, our hope is that we're gonna grow the sport and attract under-indexed fans to these facilities because this is a business imperative for our sport, much like it is for any of our, of our leagues and any of my uh, counterparts in those other organizations. Thanks, Omar. And I, I think we'll continue to build on that point. So we're gonna do a little bit of reverse order. So I'm gonna come right back to you, Omar. Okay. But I, I'm gonna change the question slightly uh, as we thought about it, because I think Jason challenged us when he talked about what can we do on the technical side. Uh, and you mentioned, very specifically how this is integrated into your business. It's not something on the side and a nice to do. It's not philanthropic. It's about business strategy and the longevity and sustainability of your sport, of your livelihood, right? Of those folks that, that are part of the NHL in that sport. 
So, so tell us more specifically what the teams are doing in the, in the areas of infrastructure. What are they doing in terms of innovation and technology within their operational footprint? Absolutely. So I think the first, the first part is that um, to drive home the point, this is a business imperative for all of us. And when I mean business imperative, I'm literally talking about where does the league or these organizations get their revenues from? So in our, in our terms, it's fans. It's about ensuring that we have our fandom, consumers of our, of our, of our sport so that we can negotiate media rights deals, so that we can negotiate um, corporate partners coming to the table, so that we can address the growing um, uh, demographic changes in our, in our society, in the US and Canada, and reflect those needs to, um, to, uh, to grow the sport in a meaningful way, right? So that's the framework. How do we do it? is uh, it's multi, uh, multi-functional and multi-partite. In other words, we're doing it through establishing leadership at the league level to really kind of drive this change at a cultural level. When you see my boss, Kim Davis, who is our senior executive vice president of social impact, she talks about changing the hockey culture so that our sport becomes di- um, diverse and inclusive. And we need to separate and pull that right down to our entire ecosystem. So to give you an example to illustrate that point, we have developed innovations. And we've, you've heard, many people have heard me talk about sustainability equals innovation. We've, talked, we've t- looked at innovations in infrastructure where we're developing um, uh, street hockey courts that um, can convert both to basketball and hockey. And that way we can get perhaps under indexed communities that may not be able to historically play our game to come in and, and engage in our game and to learn about hockey values in a meaningful way. And so they, um, they address these barriers to entry of, of, of equipment and, and getting ice time. So this is in a meaningful way to address social sustainability in our game. We're seeing that our clubs are really taking on this mantra. Climate Pledge Arena is one but certainly we're seeing others that are growing the game in terms of equity to women um, hockey players, to youth, underserved youth communities, particularly indigenous communities in Canada, as well as urban areas in the US with our learn to play and learn to skate programs in public schools. And buoying that by making a natural connection between hockey and physical literacy and things like STEM education, where we have one of the most robust STEM education platforms in sports. All of these together contribute to this mantra of creating vibrant health communities, innovation to really try and address what is this business imperative for the NHL. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Good, good stuff. Um, Jason, he mentioned the next kind of segue to the question, Climate Pledge Arena. You know, we've heard a vision. We, we heard it as this is the first, you know, uh, large stadium in the world that can go to a net zero uh, GHG carbon impact, you know. So tell us more about the strategy and, and how you got people to align. And then I don't know if you're going to give us our secrets of your design, but give us as much as you can. <laughs> well, I think I better uh, put on my favorite new hat. We're going to talk about this. Uh, this is the new logo for the Seattle Kraken and uh, my new favorite hockey team. Uh, hopefully we'll have lots of Canadians on the ice, actually, is what I'm hoping as well. But uh, I'm uh, cheering for the Canadians as well. But um, no, it's been uh, it's been a real fantastic process working um, on the Climate Pledge uh, arena uh, with a whole host of people. It certainly, uh, you know, wasn't just me. It was uh, incredible commitment from NHL Seattle, uh, OVG, Amazon, uh, the, uh, the whole team of, of contractors and architects and designers that really wanted to do something that um, was really going to uh, make a difference. Uh, I think starting it out that the idea that the arena is not named after a company, but is in fact named after a, a commitment uh, to tackle climate change is a signal of the of the scope of the intention of this project, which also really began with saving a historic structure in Seattle, this wonderful historic roof, uh, which was like you know 44 million pound roof that they didn't have to build from scratch that they saved and, and represented a ton of embodied carbon uh, uh, in, in, in the materials and then essentially building a whole new uh, arena under it. 
And as I mentioned in my talks earlier, um, if you're going to call something the climate pledge arena, you, you can't be burning natural gas under the roof. <laughs> uh, it has to be fossil fuel free. And so there was a huge shift that uh, everyone on the team did uh, to essentially decarbonize the plan there, um, to get rid of all the natural gas for uh, cooking and heating, hot water, and even dehumidification of the ice, uh, which is traditionally a natural gas driven process, uh, all the way down to the Zamboni, which uh, is electric, you know, all the way down to that. Um, and then looking at, well, where now, if we're, we're going all electric, in, in, in essence, where do we get that electricity and making sure that we are using renewables, uh, both a commitment to some on site renewables. Um, which will happen um, at the entrance uh, to uh, the, the arena, as well as on the, the adjacent garage, uh, and then offsite solar and wind uh, to meet all the electricity demand for the building. Um, we didn't stop there, and part of what's happening is looking at the entire carbon footprint, all the scope emissions, as we call it, how do fans get to the games or to the venue, um, what kind of transportation do they take, what's the carbon footprint, associated with running the events of getting people in, including artists and, and athletes to and from, accounting for all of that and then offsetting all that carbon uh, and then getting that certified by the International Living Future Institute based here in Seattle. And that really is, this all, you know, all comes together as a remarkable step uh, of leadership um, for the team and the industry, I think, to really go beyond a paradigm of of just sort of minimizing our damage to saying, how do we completely change our footprint? And it's not just energy, that's you know the thing that I focus on you know first typically, but it's also waste. Um, we have a, a functional net zero waste strategy of 97% diversion rate or better, uh, where we're trying to compost or recycle everything that will be used. You, you know, it's like a whole city that shows up for an event, and that's a huge amount of waste that's typically generated. Uh, but doesn't have to be there. Um, looking at how do we get unused food to food banks so that we're reducing that waste as part of the strategy, composting everything we can locally, returning it back to the soil, and then banning single-use plastic, which was kind of this big you know, idea that we put forward, and, and, and I'm just happy to say that we're on track with that as well. And if we can get rid of plastics uh, in our oceans and in our environment, that's another huge step that we have to take. Um, there's all sorts of things we're doing beyond that, um, but maybe I'll stop there. And, and again, the point with all of this is, is deciding that you want to make a difference and then going for it. And maybe not every arena can do all the things or every stadium do all the things we're doing right now, but a lot of this they can, and they can make big steps. And if you're you know, planning something in the horizon, the challenge is on now to go further than we did or we're going to do here in Seattle. Um, let's not be complacent. Let's keep raising the bar. That's great. I know uh, ROI wise, you know, I know sometimes that's a challenge. And if I think if you become, you know, more innovative and looked at disruptive technology, sometimes you can think differently in your process or how you look at your supply chain and make that ROI come out the right way. It's not always about, you know, the immediate dollars that you that you bring back to the bottom line on that. You know, fans and, and community so important. You have to make that investment as well. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I think it kind of pushes back to Dennis, the next question, you know, and we know um, the impact and, you know, that you've had on the Green Sports Alliance by supporting us early on in our infancy. So we appreciate the Bullet Foundation getting this off to the right start. Um, what impact has the Bullet Foundation made as you sunset the organization in the, in the future? And what void will that leave? Who will step in and kind of take the role? Like how do you pass the baton and then um, what's next for the Bullet Center? Because I know that goes on and continues to provide innovation and support. Um, so I'd like you to kind of address those questions. <laughs> you sound like a <laughs> board of trustees, Roger. Um, well, I think that the, the baton is going to be passed on fairly easily. There's a lot of money that's developing in the Seattle area and the Pacific Northwest in general. It's, it's a remarkably affluent part of the country. And a lot of folks who have cashed out of their companies are now setting up foundations and some fraction of those have a very strong environmental ethos. Uh, for us, the decision to, to spend down was basically that, that we're now facing a bunch of issues that either get solved today or they will not be solved ever. And it just did not seem to make sense to hold money that we would spend 50 years from now when we are 
we're close to the opportunity to get some serious progress done. Um, if we've been spending down for about 15 years now, spending significantly more than the endowment was producing just because we just kept encountering things that were both important and urgent. And uh, the formal announcement that we're spending down was mostly uh, not for ourselves, but for our grantees so that they could begin to anticipate that there would be a world post bullet coming in another five years. With regard to impact, um, I mean, standing on the shoulders of some of the things that Jason was saying about this remarkable new stadium or remarkable refurbished stadium in Seattle, you know, there's something inherent about athleticism of always trying to make leapfrog goals to something that nobody's ever done before. I mean, it, it's everybody wants to be, you know, Muhammad Ali, I am the greatest. And for some period of time, you are the best that there can be. In our own little modest way, uh, what we did with the Bullet Center was 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 that we we set out to become the greenest office building in the world. We stood on the shoulders of some of the Living Building Challenge that Jason was instrumental, the the author of, and what that meant was going around town, talking to a bunch of real estate developers, and asking how we could meet the various goals within it, and being told time after time after time, you can't. I mean, forget return on investment. You just technically can't do it. Uh, the amount of solar power that you can generate on the roof of a building is not enough to meet the plug loads of the building, much less meet all of the operating energy requirements and the lighting. Um, and, and in our own little Muhammad Ali moment, said, oh, that was just a challenge. Adam, we're going to do it. And uh, in the end, found a way to build a building that uses and keeping everybody very comfortable and very well lit and with all of the computer power that they need uses one fourth as much energy as if we built the building to code one half as much energy as if we'd been a lead platinum build I mean, really pushing the frontiers of efficiency and then we took our solar and, and didn't just cover the roof we made it like a mortar board so it stretched out over the sidewalks around it we actually leased a little bit of airspace on the sidewalks around the building to get just as much solar as we can so that we're in this interesting position of being in the cloudiest major city in the contiguous 48 states and yet having the only six-story true net zero energy building office building in the world and we did it because we stuck our neck out and and then across the board thing after thing we are net carbon zero we are uh, zero net water uh, we have nothing that is toxic in the building we have all sorts of aspects of social justice that were involved in the construction of the building uh, we've set aside a, a park and developed it as a natural space, the first living park, as it were, in, in the world. Um, and then you say, well, yeah, you're a foundation. You got a bunch of money. You even decided you're going to spend down. No big deal, but I got a business here I got to operate. It turns out that our costs were roughly at the 60 percentile level for Class A office space in Seattle. We did it by making choices. Uh, we, we, we couldn't find some solar panels that were cheaper than asphalt shingles to put up on a roof, but we, we traded off stuff. So if you have a Class A office building, it often will quarry marble from Carrera, Italy, and ship it across the ocean and across the continent. And put Carrera marble, sometimes in elevators, so you're taking that extra weight up 40 stories and bringing it back down. Uh, we don't have any granite countertops. We don't have any Chihuly sculptures in our lobby. And yet no one has ever entered the bullet building and said, oh my God, what a dump. I mean, it's, it's elegant. It, we, we did with design what we could have done by just throwing money at the problem. It has no aspect, if you'll pardon me, being just a little tiny bit political of anything that would be appearing in Trump Tower. We have no gold lame over anything. But this is a very elegant building that is designed to show what could be done economically right at what was then the frontier of sustainability. And uh, that's exactly what athletic teams and athletes ought to be about, both with regard to their work, their stadiums, their personal lives, their homes, everything. You guys are role models for, for the world, and uh, people pay attention to what you do. Oh, that, was, that was marvelous insights, and thank you for sharing, sharing that. Um, we're going to keep the conversation going and pass it back to you, Mary, you know, as you think about the spectrum of conversation, getting back to, to governance and frameworks. I mean, you have a, I mean, human rights is, you know, when you think about it and everything that's going on, that's a, that's a big, big animal that you have in front of you. So how are you managing 
the frameworks, the governance, and how do you keep score with, with stakeholders and hold people accountable uh, in your world? <laughs> well, the news cycle is is a, usually what ends up keeping score, which is not where we, we live, um, but our members do do that, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and others, um, you know, our advocacy organizations. But that said, the, um, the Center for Sport and Human Rights is made up of uh, actors from the entire ecosystem of sport. So governments, so we have several governments, um, there are foreign ministries who are actively part of the center, um, sports bodies themselves, international and professional sponsors for mega sporting events, um, such as Coca-Cola, Visa, AB InBev and others, um, trade unions, civil society and UN agencies. And by UN agencies, I mean those that are the standard bearers of human rights internationally, such as the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the ILO, so on and so forth. Um, you asked about frameworks. Uh, what we do is we work together, uh, all of us, um, towards the same goal. And the same goal is um, to ensure that sports protects human rights. So, we work and to do that we use uh, the best framework that is out there and it's been adopted by countries and businesses globally and that's the un guiding principles for business and human rights or what we call the ungps the ungps um, basically outline very clearly uh, what the role is of governments to so states but governments to protect human rights and what their job is um, but it also says businesses and in this case, when it comes to sports, I'm going to say any organization that's conducting uh, activity that has an economic benefit or an economic interest, right? So that's where you know sports comes in in case there's any ambiguity. Um, so what business's role is or organization's role is, is to respect human rights. And the UNGPs give a very specific set of guidelines on how to do that. And part of that is accountability. So due diligence to know what's happening, how can I manage those risks? What risks are mine that I need to do something about? What are other risks that aren't mine, but I have leverage to do something about it? I can give examples of that, that's helpful. Um, and then finally, when things go wrong, um, how do you make it right? So that's remedy. How do, you, how do you restore the situation as best as you can and put somebody back to where they were before the harm occurred? So those are just in general, that's the framework we use, the UN Guiding Principles. And the work we do at the um, Center for Sport and Human Rights is we demystify that, right? I had to do that work when I, uh, when I had to uh, write the human rights strategy for the bid. I didn't understand any of this stuff. I come from sports. Um, and there was a whole new vocabulary and set of actors at the UN and, and internationally that I didn't understand. And what we do at the uh, at the center is we work with sports governing bodies, be they professional leagues, domestic, international, what have you. And we help them understand what does it mean to commit to respect human rights? What's that involve? How do you embed it in your organization? And then on an ongoing basis, how do you know whether or not you're managing your risks well? Um, how to mitigate bad things to keep them from happening, prevent and mitigate. And then finally, when things go wrong, um, what's yours and what's not yours? Um, and what do you have a duty to, to inter, uh, engage in or perhaps um, uh, indirectly engage in to rectify the problem? So that's what, what we do. And um, there's accountability that's linked into that, but really we are helping sports bodies navigate this, this work and using the framework of the UN guiding principles. Excellent. Thank you, Mary. That's, that's excellent. So we're in the kind of final phases. So I'm going to go rapid fire here. And this is one question that I love because this is where people can learn from your successes and maybe your setbacks or failures. So, you know, let tell us your most three valuable lessons learned. And I'm going to start with Jason so you can impart the wisdom of that of that question so people can learn from your experience. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, the first thing I would tell people is if you want to make change, don't use guilt and shame, use inspiration and lead by example. So that's the first thing that I would uh, mention. The second um, I would mention is don't let others limit what you can do. 
kind of like what Dennis was talking about with the Bullet Center, is that if, if people have a tendency to try to put a box around what they think is possible for you, your organization, your business, your life, and that doesn't work. <laughs> and then the third thing that I'll mention in terms of uh, this kind of work is focus on, on, on really the ideal thing that you want to solve. Don't self-limit yourself from the beginning. It's a real sad thing I see where people say, well, we can't get there. We have to take baby steps and let's just be incremental and then we'll see what we can do. And all that they've done is ensure that in the end, they will have not gotten to where they really wanted to go. And so the idea is to really be clear about where you want to go, where you want to head and hold on to that as hard as you can. And even if you don't get there, you'll end up way further than you did. Those are my three Love things. It. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. Fantastic. So continuing to inspire more action, I'm going to go to Omar with the same question. Excellent. So um, by the way, I love Jason's inspiration points. Um, so mine are really simple. Um, and I mentioned one of them before. This is a movement, not a moment. This is part of a much longer journey. Um, we aren't going to be able to get there overnight. This is something that we are, it's a marathon. I can give you all the other <laughs> Um, all the other uh, ways you can slice and dice that comment. But the fact is, is that um, uh, we need to know what the goals are, but we need to know that there's going to be a, a, a method and a, and a way to get there. And it's, it's, it's us taking that charge, um, a movement on a moment. The second thing I would say is um, we talk about this a lot, authenticity. Um, you know, authenticity in, in, in how we construct and how we talk about these things. Um, athletes uh, talk about authenticity all the time, right? They can say one thing and they can, but if they're doing something else, like, you know, talking about environmental, but then living in a 25,000 square foot home and flying their private jets, obviously that's not going to work. But, but to the point that we're making, this is a moment now where athlete um, activism is really driving the discourse across outside of sports, across all facets of our society. And it's up to us in sports organizations to give them the right tools so that they can sh get their voice heard and to educate them on the messaging that they can effectively impart to fans. Okay, authenticity is clear. Is clear. And a simple tactical one, you cannot impact what you do not measure. Um, and that is not just for building performance, this goes the entire gamut of environmental, financial, and social sustainability, particularly social justice um, and things that, that, you know, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to measure. Um, and, but we need to push the industry. We need to push our stakeholders to really drive that agenda so that we can report against it, so that we know how to address this in a meaningful way. Excellent. I love it. Thanks, Omar. And then I'm going to push to Mary on your three kind of words of, you know, ideas of wisdom here. Okay, real quick. It's it's not three, it's it's two, but um, and they're related. Um, and they relate to what Omar said. Um, I'm going to say stakeholder engagement. So if you really want, and I learned this indelibly, um, and I would say that as a sports administrator, I was not very good at this. And then I had to run the whole process at the United Bid and I got religion. And that is stakeholder engagement. So whatever situation you're dealing with, who are the people affected? And I mean adversely affected, not passively, but who are the people who are being harmed? Put them in the center of the room. They are, they, if you want authenticity, you make them the center of everything you're talking about and you engage with them and say, what is it that we need to know about what's happening to you? How do we prevent it? How do we make it better? How do we make it right? Um, that's true stakeholder engagement. And I'll end by saying the example that we're seeing is the leagues that are successfully dealing, uh, uh, engaging with athletes on Black Lives Matter. The leagues that are sitting down with the players and saying, we're gonna talk about this together, that's stakeholder engagement. This idea of nothing about me without me, you know, rather than talking about what athletes can and can't do in terms of protest, right? Let's talk about why they're protesting, right? Let's talk about why they're protesting in the first place and why they feel the need to speak out. And then we can talk about what's a way that that can be expressed. So for me, those are, those are two critical things um, that I've learned in this job for sure. And it's happening right now. 
Very powerful. Thank you, Mary. And then Dennis, you know, we'll end with you on kind of sharing in, in those condensed state, you know, kind of your your setbacks, your learnings, your failures, your successes, kind of what your wisdom would be. <laughs> it's way too close to the end of this program for me to start on my failures, I'm afraid, Roger. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we've gone from three to two. I think I might actually reduce this just to one, and it relates very closely to what Mary is talking about, and it's really one big broad lesson that I earned very early. People often ask, how in the world in 1970 when there was no internet, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no TikTok, there was no email, uh, how in the world did you get 20 million people out on the streets around the environment? And the answer is you didn't. You got some people out on the streets because of the air pollution in Chicago and Los Angeles. You got other people out on the streets because of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire. Others because the Great Lakes were dying. Others because you were losing the Everglades. Others because freeways are going to be cutting through vibrant inner city neighborhoods. Whatever the issue was that was most trenchant to the people in a given community, that's what they organized about. And all that we did was put a a ribbon around the whole thing and say these are all related and they are all part of building a sustainable environment and that combination of respect for the people who are most affected by some decision plus some level of humility is also the crucial aspect of of running a successful philanthropy which is what i've been doing for the last couple of decades uh, as people come to you with proposals, you realize that there's a lot more wisdom out there than there is in your office. And you have to be open to it, paying careful attention. Jason came to me with this idea for a living building challenge that was something I would never have come up with in a million years. Uh, and yet it was something that just really struck a chord with me. And we not only gave him a grant, but decided, let's go out and build one of those things. Uh, it's it's a, a recognition that, that there's a huge amount of wisdom in crowds, and you have to be open to it and give it whatever support you can. Love it. You guys have been a fabulous, unbelievable. I mean, we need more time. Obviously, we don't have more time, but the uh, I, this the density and the richness of the conversation was fantastic. I really do appreciate you guys spending the time preparing, uh, even though I know this was all you know what you live every day. Um, and I personally uh, really appreciate it. I really, really do appreciate it. So we got Green Sports Day, lots more action happening, and we got our summit coming up here in the next week or so with a lot more depth of these conversations, and we will keep the conversation going. So game on, the future of sports, and we really appreciate uh, your time today. So thank you. We'll sign, we'll sign off. But I'll be, I'll be following up with each and every one of you as we move forward. So thanks. Hey, thank you, everybody. All right. Okay.